Week 6, Lesson 1, The Taming of Comics. As you might have guessed by reading the Comic Code Authority's lists, comics were going to lose whatever they had. This was especially true for the remaining superheroes. Remember that DC got rid of all its superheroes, with the exception of the big three, Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. So, what happened to them when they stopped fighting the Axes? Let's start with Superman. Superman started off with almost an anti-hero attitude by today's standards. He was destroying mines and factories and giving people a taste of their own medicine. He then fought Nazi stand-ins and started to help people out with their personal problems. Once the Comic Code Authority came in, Superman was very limited with what he could do. He couldn't face any complex threats like European invaders. Things had to be simplified to the point where no one could be offended by what they read. This meant that Superman was stuck fighting aliens, teaching moral lessons, or getting involved in comedic situations. At least a third of his adventures revolved around trying to stop Lois Lane from finding out that Superman and Clark Kent were the same person, and then punish Lois for being nosy. When Clark Kent is in teaching Lois a lesson, he's being affected by red kryptonite, which always had a random effect on him, usually turning him into something ridiculous where he had to learn to use his new powers to save the day, or by turning him into a threat that his friends and allies had to come together to stop. Superman would also try and outthink his opponent. Instead of using his powers to punch out anything he came across, he limited himself to using his brains and other abilities to overcome a situation. DC also printed stories about Superman's youth, showing Clark Kent's adventures as Superboy, when he grew up with his parents trying to learn life lessons and the limits of his powers. The stories were very safe. They took place in Clark Kent's hometown of Smallville, where no one was ever in any real danger. This was also the point in Superman's career when his cast started noticeably expanding. Lex Luthor was still around, but Superman had a new enemy, Brainiac, an alien, later retconned into a robot, who came to Earth and collected capital cities. Superman also met his bizarre mirror character, Bizarro, who came across as a warped reflection of the hero. Crypto the Superdog was also created. He was revealed to be Superman's dog from his childhood, who his father shot into space to test the rocket. Superman also saved the shrunken Kryptonian city from Brainiac, which he kept in a bottle. This is the city of Kandor, filled with Kryptonians that Superman is trying to return to their normal size. It also introduced the Phantom Zone, a dimension that housed Kryptonian heroes, and Superman was introduced to his cousin, Supergirl, who was a more playful female version of Superman. That was created in order to target the young female demographic. Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane got their own titles as well. Jimmy had proven popular enough on the television and radio shows that he had his own comic series dealing with his own misadventures. Jimmy would often find himself transformed into something that Superman would have to come down and stop. I mentioned this briefly in the Romance Comics video, but Lois Lane had a series as well, which revolved around her trying to trick Superman into marrying her. She would do a bunch of stupid things to get his attention, like travel back in time, pretend to kill herself, threaten to marry other men, like Bruce Wayne, and crazy stuff like that. Superman was not trying to solve real-world problems by bringing attention to them anymore. He was doing over-the-top solutions to simple problems and teaching kids basic life lessons. Superman was also playing with non-canon stories. So, they were stories that would ask what would happen if Superman died, and similar sort of questions. Batman and Robin started doing ridiculous stories. Batman would fight aliens, he would travel through time, he would show off his new impractical gadgets, he would deal with overly complex situations, and his villains were just as silly. The Joker went from being a mass-murdering psychopath to a prankster who committed crimes because he wanted Batman's attention and to stop himself from being bored. His crimes were over the top and elaborate, but never caused anyone serious harm. The Penguin, a fat upper-class criminal, showed up more regularly. He would act buffoonish and easily be stopped. All the villains were toned down so that children would not find them upsetting. Now, it's important to note that Batman started becoming more ridiculous and child-friendly during World War II, and continued that trend after the war into the 1950s, 
before the Comet Code Authority happened. Batman was turned into an alien. Batman had a portable Batcave. Batman was affected by aliens surprisingly often. He also had a new sidekick, Bat Hound. He was harassed by a magical imp slash fanboy named Batmite who had the power to alter reality. And just to have a non-criminal romantic interest for Batman, to prove he wasn't gay for Robin, Batwoman and Batgirl were created. Batman's adventures were much more cartoonish than they used to be. When the Comic Code Authority was put into effect, very little about Batman had changed. This was the era that inspired the Adam West Batman television show. However, due to budget constraints and effects limitations, the Batman television show was significantly more grounded than its comic book counterpart. As for Wonder Woman, she seemed to lose her identity more than either Superman or Batman did. As was mentioned in the video about early comic book superheroines, Wonder Woman started out with a heavily sexual undertones and the writers and artists fetishes appearing on the pages. As you can guess, those quickly disappeared after the code was put into place. But the even bigger change in Wonder Woman was that she started depending on her boyfriend, Steve Trevor, to get things done. Wonder Woman became much less dominant and more submissive to fit into the Comic Code's authority standards about what was going on. Remember when Murphy wanted to change the astronaut from a black man into a white one? Well, the reason for that was to promote his view of America, where Caucasians were running things. The same deal happened with Wonder Woman. The people behind the Comic Code Authority didn't want the status quo for adults in America to change. They didn't want women acting as equals or superiors to men because of this. They wanted Wonder Woman to reflect that so that she could be a better role model for girls at the time. She became daintier and much less interesting. Remember that when these characters first appeared, it was because they were supporting the visions of their creators. Superman was an incredibly powerful figure doing what he had to to make America and the world a safer place. Wonder Woman was a loving, powerful woman that would be so confident that men would want to submit to her. Batman was a rich millionaire who took the law into his own hands in his spare time. When the war broke out, they all shifted their priorities to help the war effort. Stopping spies, stopping corruption, and supporting the men overseas. With Superman and Batman, it's safe to say that the creators wanted them to go into this direction. Wonder Woman was helping out the American military before the war broke out, so this also made sense for her character. After the war, they had lost their way. Batman and Superman had shorts and serials during the war, increasing their popularity, but after the war, their purpose was in question. Superheroes were created when Franklin Roosevelt was promoting the New Deal, and they helped the public accept that people more powerful than themselves had the American public's best interest in mind. After they helped defeat the Axes, their reasons for existing was in question. This was one of multiple reasons that superhero comics plummeted in sales after World War II ended. By the time the Comics Code Authority appeared, Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel had stopped writing Superman because of legal reasons, which led to them having a fallout with the company DC Comics, or National Comics as it was known at the time. Bob Kane was working on Batman in name only. Unknown to DC Comics, Bob Kane had hired ghostwriters to continue working on his stories. William Moulton Marston, the creator of Wonder Woman, died in 1947, at the age of 53. These characters were now separated enough from their original creators that they had become the company's National Comics or DC Comics property. It was up to the editors to choose what to do with them, and the company wanted to create safe stories that didn't offend anyone. They wanted to keep their jobs, and they wanted to get sales. Objectively looking back at these stories, they're terrible. The art is clean, but the conflicts are forced and the scope tends to be limited. Still, the stories are so over-the-top, weird, and even innocent at times that they do have their fans. The Adam West Batman television show was inspired by these stories, and is still looked on fondly today. And even some of today's biggest writers in the comic book industry, like Grant Morrison, look back to this era for inspiration. So, why is this important to the course? Because the characters became watered-down versions of themselves, and the stories weren't even challenging for children to read. All the major characters' original creators had stopped writing them, 
leading to the company controlling the characters and having the final say in what they could or couldn't do. Superhero comics had lost whatever edge they had and were trapped telling stories that couldn't challenge the reader or the characters in any way. Questions to contemplate. How would the comic book characters be different if their stories ended when their original creators stopped writing them? Would this make the comic book industry better or worse?